Good day, everyone, and welcome to Territories Talk. I am your co-host, Shana Smith-Archer from the beautiful Virgin Islands. With me today, I have my good sister friend from Montserrat, Shirley Osborne. And we have a very interesting topic today, as always. And I, myself, personally, am really looking forward to this because it is very... Um, it's been storing up quite a bit of discussion for the past few weeks, so we felt it was important, again, you know, as part of our mission to inform and unite our overseas territories family, that we, you know, educate ourselves on what is going on within the region um, that may or may not affect us, but we need to always be aware of what is happening. So with us today, we have Ambassador Dr. Clarence Henry, and he is from the uh, from Antigua and Barbuda, and he is going to share with us what the CARICOM free movement is about, as far as CARICOM's policy, and enlighten us about the recent statement or position that the Antigua government took um, as it relates to that. So, without any further ado, I um, welcome Ambassador. The floor is yours. Thank you ever so much. I am. In indeed grateful delighted to be here joining you on this um, territory territories talk uh, this morning i'm honored indeed honored uh, to join you um we have an interesting subject matter uh, for discussion it is one which over the last 30 years or so uh, that I've been engaged at the regional level as ambassador to CARICOM, that I have had the opportunity to represent Antigua and Barbuda. Um, it is for us an opportune time to clarify and to inform and to disseminate the information as pertaining to the full free movement of CARICOM National's decision taken last year in Trinidad and Tobago. Now, it is important that we establish what is the revised treaty of Shakaramas. This is it, mm -hmm. uh, what we term as the Bible the blueprint that guides discussions within the community on matters related to um, everything CARICOM. Um, so the revised treaty of Shagaramas was signed by the heads of government of the Caribbean community on the 5th July 20, 2001. In the preamble of the treaty, the heads made reference to the 89 Grand Anse Declaration, Grand Anse in Grenada Declaration and other decisions of the Conference of Heads. Uh, the treaty has 10 chapters, the same book that I showed. It has 10 chapters. The first eight chapters relate to the CARICOM single market and economy. That CSME has been a project that the region has engaged with um, for the last 20 or so years. Um, globalization and international trade liberalization were the buzzwords that the region had to contend with and therefore created an environment to insulate itself from what was happening globally. The EU model was used as a best practice to address the global challenges of the time. In particular, the commitment to deepening regional economic integration through the establishment of the CARICOM single market and economy in order to achieve sustained economic development based on international competitiveness coordinated economic and foreign policies, functional cooperation, and enhanced trade and economic relations with third states. The CSME is not a political integration movement. I say again, 
The CSME is not a political integration movement. Its purpose is economic, economic integration. Consequently, the decisions of the organs, including the Conference of Heads, on matters of the CSME must ultimately be reduced to how they improve the economic conditions of member states. The treaty also recognizes the differences in resource endowment in the levels of economic development of member states. It also acknowledges that some member states, particularly the less developed countries, were entering the CSME at a disadvantage by reason of size, structure, and vulnerability of their economies. Within the context of the treaty, the heads agreed to Articles 45, which is the movement of community nationals in which the member states committed themselves to the goal of free movement of their nationals within the community. Additionally, Article 46, which is the movement of skilled community nationals, in which 12 categories of skills were agreed upon to move and work within the community. These categories that were agreed upon over time are university graduates, artists, musicians, sportspersons, media workers, nurses, teachers, artisans with CVQs, holders of associate degrees or comparable qualifications, household domestics with a CVQ or equivalent qualification, agricultural workers and security officers. Those are the categories that have been agreed upon and have been approved for free movement on the what is called the skills regime. Mm -hmm. It is, ladies and gentlemen, not a perfect system. There are numerous challenges. That is the certification for a number of skills with CVQs can be challenging to validate. And at the heart of the same revised treaty is the goal of free movement of people. Over time, successive conference of heads expose an implementation agenda for the CSME as the main community project. However, there have been constant public criticism that the gatherings were more talk shops. So, here comes the planning for the observance of the 50th anniversary of the formation of CARICOM, which was last July 4th, 2023. Mm -hmm. Some member states felt that it was opportune at that time to have some meaningful gesture to demonstrate that we were achieving something. Hence, the idea was to have full free movement, perhaps for six months. And a, an idea for which there were hardly any takers. Lo and behold, with the pump and fanfare in Trinidad, the idea of full free movement was placed on the table and subsequently approved by the conference. However, the necessary analytical study was not undertaken to underpin the process or proposal. The heads and co-ted, and this is interesting, the heads and co-ted had previously taken a decision to require deep analysis when considering the expansion of the skills regime, the categories therein. However, this was not done prior to taking this historic and impactful decision. Hence, the heads were not even given an analysis on migration patterns to see which countries may be impacted or mostly impacted. So, ladies and gentlemen, the heads decision of 2023 set in motion the Intergovernmental Task Force 
which was activated to negotiate the amendment to the treaty, in particular, Articles 45 and 46, with Antigua and Barbuda taking an active and vocal part in those proceedings. What is our position? The question is, following the February 24 Conference of Heads meeting in Guyana, we issued a statement on 4th March to clarify our position on the movement of all CARICOM nationals to avoid any ambiguity in the public. It must be stated that throughout the meetings of the IGTF, Antigua and Barbuda signaled that it wished to maintain the use of the current skills regime, which allows us to focus on addressing our labor force demands in the local market. I affirm that we are currently implementing one of the most liberal Im immigration policies across the region and is considered a forerunner in the integration movement. Historically, the country has practiced an open door immigration policy while under the leadership of the father of our nation, Sir V.C. Bird, uh, which continued on the successive Labour Party administrations until the global economic crisis brought on severe challenges, which made it impossible to continue. The CSME skills regime was then adopted as a means to allow the jurisdiction to strengthen necessary human resource capacity. The policy is, pragm is pragmatic and clearly realistic to avoid dislocation of the indigenous population, protecting jobs, and to prevent the burdening of our social services, education, healthcare, etc. Colleagues, while we remain committed to the regional integration movement, we continue to balance our resources through a process of managed migration with the current skills regime. This is why we are not giving consent to the full free movement of all CARICOM nationals, as is being contemplated by other member states within CARICOM. And this is supposed to take effect March 31st, and that is Friday. However, we shall signal our readiness to move towards full free movement of all CARICOM nationals once we have determined that our country is better equipped to adequately accommodate the possible additional inflows of CARICOM nationals who may intend to reside and work in our country. Indeed, Friday will be a historic red letter day when one of the most impactful decisions would be operationalized. Countries will have to declare whether they are in or out of this new arrangement. Clarity is therefore required by all to avoid being brought before the CARICOM or Caribbean Court of Justice for not honoring the obligation of full free movement. So therefore, it is a choice to be made by all, all 15 member states. Once determined, there is a clear need for the CARICOM secretary to undertake a comprehensive public education program, such as what we are doing now on this matter of full free <laughs> movement of skills to avoid needless confusion. The public is in need of clarification, education with respect to this matter. And opt out is our way, ladies and gentlemen, of avoiding a sudden increase in the movement of CARICOM nationals to our shores 
Antigua and Barbuda has the largest CARICOM diaspora in the community and is presently accommodating the movement of over a thousand persons from the region annually with restricted free movement. Our Prime Minister Dustin Brown recently opined that every four years we have an amnesty initiative in which over 4,000 CARICOM nationals are given the opportunity to regularize the immigration status. He also stated that the principle we are working with is the fact that people with the ability to move with restriction, without restriction, normally move to places where they have relatives and friends. Therefore, out of an abundance of caution, Antigua and Barbuda will opt out to avoid any potential overcapacity and attendant socio-economic consequences. Colleagues, I wish to applaud the statements of Bermuda and the BVI, which have signaled their intention to opt out of the free movement of people regime if they become full members of the community, given your geographical size and population. Your decision is understandable. <coughs> In my reflections, I wonder if other OECS heads are considering following Antigua and Bobby's position. There must be deep reflections, ladies and gentlemen, deep introspection on the immediate and long-term implications of signing the protocol on Friday to amend the treaty. The fundamental questions are, Signing of this protocol on Friday benefits who? Who will it ultimately benefit? Is it politically, fiscally, and economically expedient to implement this ultimate CARICOM treaty ambition of full free movement of nationals now or even in the next seven years? I maintain that such a significant decision must be predicated on thorough, independent, and comprehensive impact assessment. Where have you ever heard of such a huge decision being taken without proper and adequate analysis? The abandoning of the focus on movement of skills and conflated this, conflating it, with the movement of all CARICOM nationals creates confusion with respect to the ultimate goal of the CSME, which is economic integration. I maintain that a proper assessment needs to be made of the budgetary implications of meeting the commitments associated with the decision. This would be different clearly for each member state. It cannot be one size fit all approach, not at all. Moreover, in conclusion, the decision on free movement should not be confused with the desire of some member states to augment their domestic population. The fact is that all member states in the CSME, save perhaps Haiti, is underpopulated. Therefore, one way movement of CARICOM nationals from one member state to another would simply lead to a worsening of the situation in the sending member state. A regional migration study which takes on board national migration strategies in each member state is the better approach to treating with the low population issues confronting the community. Two days ago, I heard a news item which informed that Barbados is now seeking to undertake such a focused analysis. The question then is whether this shouldn't be undertaken as a regional project before this very Friday decision 
ladies and gentlemen, the time is now. The time is now. It is a monumental decision that countries, territories that are seeking full to become full members of the community need to make. I thank you, colleagues. Okay. Dr. Dr. Henry, um, can I ask you a question? Let me just let me preface this first by saying that I um I'm an integrationist. I really believe that the Caribbean, the islands of the Caribbean have to work together. We really have to be pulling together to create the mass that the world needs so that we can we can have impact in the places that are important to us. I am also one of those people who think that CARICOM is pretty much a waste of time. Um, CARICOM is not, um, so I want, the first question I want to ask you is, what really is the point of CARICOM today? Is CARICOM fulfilling its purpose? And uh, what purpose is that? And, um, well, mm -hmm. yeah. yes, what, what, what really is the well, purpose of CARICOM? What, what yeah. is integration in CARICOM's terms? Today? You have started the ball and it's a hard ball you have thrown. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, but as a careful watch your hearts one, let me, I realize that let yes. me set let me take um take a guard, my guard, and let oh. me say this. We cannot get away from the premise that CARICOM is a useful organization the coming together of these small states, whether large or small, all are still considered to be small, relatively small in the global context. Um, the treaty, when we signed, and it came into being in 73, there were clear goals. Um, it creates the opportunity of fun functional cooperation, as I alluded to, um, their uh, um, common foreign policy approaches. They are clear, useful um, rationale why we can um, confront global challenges collectively. And indeed, we utilize it at, as a platform so to do. Um, by having the 15 members, you would have uh, many other um, global strong countries looking up to CARICOM as opposed to one of our territories, one of our member states speaking on its own volition. Uh, they would have to take note of the bloc and international uh, relations are all about how best you can impact and um, be irrelevant whether uh, in a community or whether at international forums or fora. Uh, so CARICOM is relevant. It has its place. Um, we meet uh, at different meetings, whether it's meetings of the organs and there's numerous organs of the community. Um, you have the, Council for Trade and Economic Development, CoTED, that meets roughly um, twice annually. Uh, and sometimes we meet in special sessions. You also have the second highest organ of the community, which is the Community Council of Ministers, which uh, sets the agenda for heads. Uh, and then you have the Conference of Heads, where um, you have meetings, roughly about seven meetings in any year, um, but, two face-to-face face 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 and but, but a I, number. I, I'm not, I don't want to interrupt you, but the, that's exactly the point. That's what people are saying about CARICOM. There are a lot of meetings, but a lot yeah. much doesn't show up. And if you talk, for example, and I, I, I want to come to the integration issue, the, the movement. Um, yeah. And we're going to get to that immediately. In, in just one thing I want, I want to clarify before we go because the ultimate goal of integration is what if it's not political integration then what is as, it? as i've said let, uh, me, let me just let me just say though the how, ultimate, because when the you, have when, to allow, you know you have to allow i know we, but, we just breathe in and breathe out. Allow, allow. 
because we are speaking to those who are not so familiar. So I am taking deliberately after taking my years. So after I, years. Yes. yes, we will get there, my dear. Let all ideas contend. We will get there. Um, let us not rush it, but let me explain. Um, the purpose of the integration arrangement was established many years mm -hmm. before your time. Long, long years ago, before you had um, the Federation coming up. Mm -hmm. um, long before my time and your time has explained. The heads, the countries felt that it was indeed desirous and desirable to engage and to have a platform to confront mm -hmm. external challenges and even internal challenges. As a block, you have the European Union. The European Union treats with a number of challenges as a block. That's why they signed on to it. There's same relation here within CARICOM. We sign on to meet our external challenges and some say internal challenges mm. as well. The meetings are necessary because you can only treat with challenges through discussion. You cannot have a prime minister or two or three in their own space, in their own capitals, determining policy for the rest of the region. Mm. So hence, and other organs where representatives of member states meet together to discuss and debate issues and mm -hmm. then arrive at a decision that all can feel comfortable with. That's the nature of blocks. Yeah. The CARICOM is a block of community countries. We are all suffering. So we meet around the table for debate, discussion, and to arrive at mutually beneficial decisions. Mm -hmm. So that is how I can answer you, Shirley. But you're saying, sir, that this in this particular case, integration, it wasn't fully thought out. The decision was made last year, but it wasn't fully thought out. You just... Um... So now we move now to this particular decision. As I said, on decisions prior to... Uh, agreement mm -hmm. they are brought uh, before the heads some and the majority decisions work their way through the different organs of the community up to the heads the heads are the ultimate at the pinnacle of the decision making in CARICOM so with respect to this it traveled uh, as I said, some thought that to observe the 50th anniversary celebrations, it would be necessary um, to have some symbolic um, occasion to suggest and to give people the feeling and uh, something to show, to demonstrate to them that CARICOM is indeed moving the dial to something more impactful and it was carried mm -hmm. uh, it was it's not the first time free movement was being discussed ultimately uh, as mentioned within the context of the treaty articles 46 and 45 particularly 45 mentions about the goal of free movement. So the heads were thinking about arriving at that goal at some point in the future. This was okay. since eight time. So mm -hmm. we are now heads today thought that we have arrived at the juncture in history that we must bring this thing to fruition. Conversely, I have opined that before we take such, mm -hmm. such impactful decision, it ought to have been guided by 
an empirical analysis. Some believe that analysis on this occasion ought not to be rendered or even thought of or even pursued. We disagree with that because once you're establishing government policies, it has to be predicated on sound empirical analysis. Mm -hmm. And uh, one may also say risk analysis. How many of us want to take such analysis? Mm -hmm. uh, well, you, you know, have, within the context of our partners in the European Union, in the US, before mm -hmm. they take a decision, proper analysis is undertaken. And yeah. we have, here in Antigua and Barbuda, we have always conducted ourselves in a proper manner through empirical analysis, through assessment. We just don't, today, go to cabinet and say, look, let us undertake that. And we make it government policy. Policies must be predicated on sound facts data analysis so oh, we, we agree with you and I, we agree with you that time and i actually i i agree with the position antigua and Barbuda is taking that it needs to be thoroughly discussed we, i think we all agree on that um mm -hmm. so that that's not the issue the the issue is i think for caribbean people on um, the people on the street who don't know all who don't understand all of these because they don't have the information is what's the point of all of this why would we need people to come and go um, if I want a job in Jamaica, I apply and I go, okay, if I want a job in the U.S., I can apply and go. You have, you know, there, there are mechanisms for this to happen all the time. But I think the confusion for most people is where are we going with this? And, you know, if you talk about it's not a political integration, but then you have issues like voting, because when you move, you're required to vote. There was a, a, um, a case brought by some Caribbean nationals in Barbados last uh, election before the last, where they were not allowed to vote. Mary. And they, they, the court said they must be allowed. So that's that's what I'm talking about. Because when people move, immigrate, integrate, migration occurs because people are moving from one place to another because they don't have what they want. They can't find it where they are. The opportunities or the, the circumstances for them, the promise is better somewhere else. So my question about integration, about, about the migration, is what are we looking for in our individual uh, uh, um, territories so that when we come together we're solid because at the beginning of federate when the federation was started one of the issues that jamaica trinidad and guyana and so on had the bigger countries had but well, jamaica and trinidad most particularly i think and barbados was that they would have to carry the smaller countries including ones that in antigua and so on right so now it's a little bit reversed shall we say um but the the, the principles still are the same people are moving to find what they want but what are we doing to ensure that, what is CARICOM doing to support individual territories so that this movement is not um, forced? It's not that you have to go. It's because, you know, I really like BVI and I want to go, you know, work in BVI because I love sailing and boating and it's really better days. Not because in Guyana things are really so bad. What's CARICOM doing? That's that's my challenge with CARICOM, to be honest. That's so my biggest problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I answer you yeah. this way. I have always long maintained that when we go to CARICOM meetings or organs of the community engagements, that we have to be frank, very mm -hmm. clear as to the interests of our own territory, our own country, and bring it to bear around the table and not sit, uh, sit silent and listen to the others and be the tokens of other ideas, but we put on the table our own thoughts and not power. Um, we have always been very focal. That is how I was raised up, to be very clear and not be takers of other people's thoughts, but to share your own thoughts. Um, mm -hmm. You're right. You're right in terms of when people move, they bring they move with their own value system, their norms, um, and their cultural values. And so care must be taken always as to how we treat with inward migration. Um, 
we are small and we are not on the same um, geographical size as uh, Trinidad, uh, Jamaica, Barbados, and Guyana. Those coincidentally are the MDCs, the more developed countries within CARICOM, the more wealthy, the more endowed. If you recall, I did mention about the less developed countries, which speak mm -hmm. to the CS member states. We are the smaller of the small within CARICOM. So we have to always ponder, always analyze what is in this thing for us. Is it truly something that this country or your country can undertake, can facilitate? Um, one of the things I was speaking on a program in Jamaica quite recently, and a distinguished individual mentioned, oh, why these territories don't want to embrace this free movement for all? It is so long, and it's time for um, us to look the other way and to allow. But we know the history. We can appreciate the challenges um, that um, come with an open door policy. Uh, you have, as I said, when people move, they move with their own value systems and you end up with a change in your own cultural uh, nuances. And so one has to be very careful. So, my sister, that's why representation at the highest level um, is key. Mm -hmm. And to bring to bear at the regional table, to speak clearly, to advocate on behalf of your own national interests, never to call, never to shy away from a debate and never to just sit in silence while the others pontificate their national positions. And sometimes the MDCs want OECS or LDCs to do that in terms of shying away and cowering. But not Antigua and Barbuda. We have constantly been pounding the table to ensure mm -hmm. that people listen and people don't take us for granted. We have demonstrated that within the context of the IGTF several meetings. We have demonstrated at the Conference of Heads where our Prime Minister has been very um, careful and straightforward. Um, in his articulations on all matters, on all agenda items that we have an interest in. Um, on this particular free movement matter, um, we spoke um, and made it clear our position at the seven or eight IGTF meetings. We even went further. We took the matter to the Community Council of Ministers. We took it to the Prime Ministerial Subcommittee on the CSME. So it had gone through several chambers or mm. organs or meetings of the community. So the opportunity must be taken at all times to restate. And the Shinik Mairi case that was referenced is an important fact and underpinning as to how countries, the representation must um, behave or carry out its mandate is to ensure that whenever we engage at the regional level, that the notes, the records of meetings are accurately reflected so that if matters 
if there's a challenge and matters have to go to the CCJ, the truth, the records will be a witness to what we said or our intentions. So, my dear, that there you have it. That, That's how Dr. I can Henry. Yes, my dear. Yes. So real quick, I need to pause and just say thank you to our media partners, uh, Cayman Mall Road, Facebook page, Radio Turks and Caicos, Montserrat ZJB Radio, Virgin Islands, CBN Radio, FN 90.9, Bermuda's Channel 82, Radio Seba, PJFE, FM 93.9, and Barbados' CBC Channel 8 all carry our program. We also want to say welcome to all the persons that are tuning in from Antigua to, today. I, we saw a few of them making comments. Um, and as far as I believe Suriname. So thank you for all that have tuned in and making your contributions. Um, real quick though, doc, uh, we need Dr. Henry, we need to get into, I mean, helping persons understand in terms of one of the interesting things you said is in terms of the analysis of what the impacts of migration have been, whether it's on the larger countries or small states such as Antigua or even the Virgin Islands. What are some of the things in terms of, I guess, daily life that you have seen um, changed or shifted as a result of um, the migration that would have been a result of trying to establish this single market and economy um, and which is what the impetus, I'm understanding based on your explanations, why we were even considering the free movement of people in, in the first instance. So what are, what are some of those things that you can probably share so that persons can understand further? You know, what, what has changed? Migration is something that is time immemorial. However, it does have impacts. And I think, I think sometimes we take them for granted, apart from the fact that yes, you need to grow your economy and um, population growth is a part of that. Sometimes it's migrated in versus, you know, natural birth rate. Yeah, well, um, let me re reaffirm that Article 45 within the treaty, which is entitled Movement of Community Nationals, uh, states member states commit themselves to the goal of free movement of their nationals within the community. Mm -hmm. So the heads agreed that, agreed to this goal established at Grand Ants since 89 and they signed it in 2001. So there has always been the goal of free movement. What has happened in the intervening period between 2001 to present has been the establishment and elaboration of the skills regime, which is like, some would say halfway done, halfway achieved. Mm -hmm. We're in which countries were authorized to allow necessary skills. And I've listed the categories, about 12 of them. Uh, we have derogations on two teachers and nurses. Um, and they are indefinite. But so that is what we and the rest of the region were honoring the mm -hmm. skills regime until last year when member states, not all, a few, came to the table when planning to observe the 50th anniversary of CARICOM, the formation of CARICOM. Some member states thought that it would be a meaningful thing to have full free movement, to fulfill this dream, this ambition of our forefathers and those who were participating in the revised treaty. 
to fulfill this long-term ambition. Um, others, like us, at the time we felt that it was premature, but, um, and we stated it at that heads meeting that the concerns of Antigua Barbuda must be considered and it is reflected in the heads decision that concerns of member states must be considered in treating with the amendments to the Treaty of Chaterons with respect to the free movement of all. So, and that's why we advocated, as I have said, since we started. Um, that's why we took that position. Um, so, free movement has its genesis um, way back, and perhaps uh, I may not be speaking out of turn by saying that um, long, long years ago, the forefathers felt that it would be the ideal position that one day the region will come together to allow people to move from um, Kingston to St. John's to Bridgetown, to Port of Spain, to Georgetown, freely across borders. Um, but the question is, who makes that determination? Is it done um, on a whim or a fancy? Or is it predicated by, through proper study, um, analysis, to ensure that there are no negative implications in so doing. And so upon reflection, um, these are the things that we have said that ought to have been treated with. Again, we are saying that the skills regime, it's not perfect. There are a lot of things that we need to still address. And perhaps we will now have the opportunity so to do. Uh, the meeting on Friday of heads where there will be a discussion where the output of the IGTF, which one would say have completed its work, and the LAC, that is the Legal Affairs Committee, will present its report to the heads. Uh, the heads will uh, either adopt and countries then would need to inform that they are signing on to this full free movement protocol or they agree to suspend for three or seven years its implementation of that particular obligation. It is critical for member states to make this determination on Friday, because if they do not signal what they have to do or want to do on that occasion, it simply means that they can be placing themselves in a position to be challenged, challenged by another member state of the community or by a citizen who would have applied, uh, who would have shown up at the border. And if a member state deny them the, uh, the, 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 the rights that would be contingent on this protocol, then the CCJ will have additional work and more lawyers within the region will have work. So are we creating work for the lawyers, additional work for the lawyers or the countries? If they don't signal come Friday what they intend to do, mm -hmm. are they requesting a derogation or are they requesting an opt-out 
<clears throat> we say out and declare. Opt out and declare is what Antigua and Barbuda will be doing. We are opting out of that until we, through the cabinet, through our parliament, have made a decision as to it is the time somewhere down in the future. It is time for us. We have the capacity. We are able to embrace this new fulfilled movement regime. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Surely you had any other points to raise? We, we're going to start to wrap up in a few. Um, I am still on the, I'm still on the, I'm still baffled by, um, how we got to, how CARICOM got to, you have to agree by such and such a date when they haven't done the work within the individual territories to ensure that everybody is ready. And I'm also confused that the heads are ignoring to my, to my mind, ignoring the realization that people want to move because they want to move not because they have to move. So the economic situations in each individual territory need to be addressed before we can get to all of these things. Um, and we talked, I made some a note here about, um, I, I, I don't think it makes sense today that we're still talking amongst ourselves about more developed and less developed countries. I don't think it is possible to say that Jamaica is more developed than Antigua, right? Well, you um, see, it is contained in the treaty, you know, and everything written in the language. treaty established the so establishes the rules opinion. of the game, yeah. the rules of our work. Yeah. So we have to go by so what is written here. Henry, maybe we need to go back to basics a little bit because the situation 50 years ago is very different to what it is now. I, I, even mm -hmm. in terms of technology and so on, the opportunities and resources that are available. So perhaps what we need to do is kind of look at that's where it was when that's where we were when we made these changes things have changed so mm -hmm. if there are not maybe there clearly are some things we need to say hold up a minute let's check back let's go back because i take the point and it's really important for places like Montserrat and antigua and bvi and so on when you have large influxes of of um of other people they are our people in many respects yeah. but they have a whole yes. bunch of them coming it changes the dynamics which is neither good nor bad we're not yes. discussing that. the point is that's what happens and that only happens. People only move in these large amounts when things are bad where they are. People want to stay home well, most. Additionally, remember Shirley. Shirley, remember there are pull factors. They yeah. are driven by what they see across exactly, the board. Exactly, which is not at home. So, yeah. <laughs> And I, I'm talking from, I can talk for Montserrat right now, for example. We we had to do a lot of migration because things were so bad in Montserrat, okay? So, mm -hmm. um, and that was driven by the volcano and all that. But there are other instances, there are other political, social, um, economic. economic issues in the individual countries which are not being addressed. And we're not going to talk yes. about Guyana, but Guyana is coming up big and big time nowadays. And that's the thing that has to be discussed. Haiti is still a problem and ha CARICOM is really seriously not helping Haiti much but we, if we but, don't but do that this sort of migration is going to continue to be a problem I have but family in Antigua we have family in, in BVI we like that we move yeah. around but we want mm -hmm. to do it because we want to Dr Henry because we want to let, not because we want to let me join you but at the same time make a clarification mm -hmm. um, it is not um haiti will not be a part of this full free movement regime let us be clear mm -hmm. on that they mm -hmm. will not be a part yeah. of that uh, the population size and of course the turmoil now um in haiti it mm -hmm. will take um a Century. number of years yes a number of years to rectify the situation there so but you're absolutely correct. Um, one particular issue that must be also placed on the table, the land size. We don't, we don't have unlimited land resources. And most times when people move, they would want to buy and have a little piece of where they're moving to. What will happen to the indigenous population? We wouldn't have 
um, or be given the chance or our kids have the chance to purchase land. So the implications are wide and far reaching. And hence, we are of the premise that careful analysis must always guide, must always lead us to make sound policy decision. And the opportunity still exists for heads, heads, heads to make a declaration as to what is in their best interest. The records would show that the member states did agree to this. But as you said, that was time past. Mm -hmm. This is time now moving forward. So today or on Friday, the opportunity will be given yeah. for each head to say what they can accept and what they cannot. What is realistic and what is futuristic. So we have already declared what we can accept and what we cannot. It is left for others to be bold, to, to, be, to be clear, and to be, um, to be forth, forthright in their submission on this matter. But as I said before, as we started, everybody is sovereign. At the table of CARICOM, everyone is sovereign. Yeah, so. that's the problem. You know, it's, it's interesting, you know, when we think about the, the bigger scheme of the region, you know, I always think about what was um, what was the motivation behind of the European Union and why the countries in the Europe continent basically came together. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, the premise of CARICOM came from a, a positive place and it is something I know, I don't think they're telling enough of their stories nationally because there are, you know, instances, for example, when I went and looked at the communique ambassador that came out of the 46th head of government meeting where, you know, the conversations, whether it was around the environment, food and um, yes. nutrition security, there's a lot of good climate work that is happening. Um, I agree with, yeah, and I agree with Shirley in terms of things are taking too long. But because it's so many member states and trying to get yes. consensus and agreement yes. is probably the, the, the biggest hurdle, I would say, that has to be surmounted. But if we sure. are able to accomplish a lot of these things that we have set out um, as goals, you know, it, it can do anything but strengthen the union. But, you know, one of the yes. takeaways I want our audience to, to make sure that they understand is that it has to be something that, again, starting from the ground level in terms of, you know, from the local states that are part of the Caribbean community, that everybody understands that we have to pull or, as we say here in the Virgin Islands, in the same direction. Otherwise, yes. that we're just going to be spinning around in the water because we, we're not able to gain the momentum that we need. So it, it's something where I think, you know, the current situation, um, is going to definitely be a teachable moment to help us and understand, you know, is CARICOM of benefit to the region, to us here nationally, and how do we make it such that we do benefit individually and collectively? Because there's always those internal fights in the European Union, same way, where, you know, the bigger economies is how I would now compare us, rather than saying less developed or more developed, because if Antigua and the Virgin Islands were still less developed, we wouldn't have the levels of migration we see because our economies exactly. have grown. So that in itself says that, you know, those aspects of the treaty do need to probably get a little update. Um, in addition to saying that this was the goal, you know, but again, doing the analysis, gathering the information to help us understand now what the policy directions need to be. And not just, you know, we're stuck in a, this is what we had decided from 50 years ago. So we have to accomplish this without any type of updating in our thinking, yes, so to speak, yes. as far as it relates to that. So I think today was a very hopefully a helpful conversation with, with persons, you know, trying to understand again, what, what is the purpose of these regional organizations, whether it's CARICOM or OECS, and on a national level that, you know, we hope to have more educational information. I know for me, I'm going to um, be reaching out 
um, in another forum to make sure that all leadership explains to us, you know, even as an associate member, because you, Montserrat was bold and they, they became a full member from the jump. And I, again, someone actually texted me and was asking why we don't have full membership. And I was saying to them that the because we're a British territory, the UK has to grant permission. So yeah. as we're seeing now with Bermuda, they, they ask for permission to, to pursue it. And therefore they have to sit down and now go through the process and anybody else, any of the other OTs would have to do um, similar. So it is something... Again, we're going to continue to have this conversation more um, on our forum here. And we really want to thank you for being a part of, of the conversation today. Any closing words? Well, I wish to express my appreciation for this invitation. It's part, a necessary part of what I deem as important, the dissemination of accurate, precise information on the revised treaty of Shagaramas, the usefulness of the integration movement of CARICOM by and large. And at the same time, how we as OECS LDCs can find our place within the CARICOM. Uh, the late Prime Minister of Barbados, Orinata, did um, author a study which looked towards the integration of the OECS into CARICOM. Um, we are still searching to see how best CARICOM uh, as a block can fully embrace the output from that study. Um, we are committed to being a part of CARICOM, but there has to be a continued dialogue and certainly dissemination of information with respect to all things CARICOM. I am grateful uh, for the opportunity uh, given to me by Prime Minister Gaston Brown to serve as ambassador to CARICOM. I am delighted to engage my colleagues uh, from time to time at the various organs of the community. It is a delight and joy just to hear both uh, even the criticism because therein lies the opportunity to clarify. Mm -hmm. I thank you for having me. All right, for being on, sir. <laughs> Thank you again for being here. We hope we can reach out to you as post decision on Friday because again the day is going to happen this week and I'm sure it will stimulate even more discussion on this topic. But yeah. you know that that is what is important. Again, like you're saying, let's have the conversations, let's understand yes. what is before us, and then from there we can make you know clear decisions on what is next. Shirley, you'd like thank to thank our media partners and close us up. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ar Dr. Um, uh, Dr. Henry, I'm saying Dr. Archer. <laughs> and thank you for the conversation. I look forward to talking to you some more about this. Antigua and Monsard have some conversations. And that whole point you talk about OECS um, as a block and so on, there, yes. there's stuff that needs to be done within the OECS too. And they've made some steps, but just like CARICOM, everything takes forever. So anyway, thank uh -huh. you very much for being on. Um, thank you for everybody, to everybody who's been, who's listened and who has commented. Sorry, we couldn't get to the questions. This was such, such intense debate. We couldn't get to your questions, but we noticed them. And, um, as we go forward with the conversations later on and other, other discussions on this matter, we will be sure to, to bring them to our guests, um, attention. Thank you to our media partners. Um, I'm not seeing the scroll here, but. Zedjabi, um, in the BVI, in Barbados, in Cayman, in Bermuda, in Antigua, in, well, here we are, Cayman Mall Road, Radio TCI, Turks and Caicos, Monsat ZGB Radio, Virgin Islands, CBN Radio, FM 90.99, Bermuda's Channel 82, Radio Sabre, PJFE FM 93.9, and Barbados CBC Channel 8. Thank you all very, very much. Look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Have a great day. Until next time. Until.